My name is Alistair Atkin. I'm a guitar maker from Canterbury in the UK. Uh, I've been building guitars for 19 years now with my business Atkin Guitars, which I started just after leaving the London School of Furniture. I built my first guitar at school in CDT class and I just got the bug and I, I continued. So I think once you've, once you've got into that situation you tend to just uh, keep wanting to repeat the process. Just before I went to college my father died and uh, quite unexpectedly and I, I found myself going into the workshop and just getting completely lost in in the guitar making and the, the peace and quiet of the situation and it became a perfect way to to just get away from the world and to really feel safe I'd say and that safety structure just provided me with this environment to, to get better after my father died and uh, as a consequence I just racked up hours and hours of building time and um, after college I, I went to work with Andy Crockett in, in a workshop in, in a place called Stourmouth in an old brewery actually and uh, Andy taught me a lot about how he made guitars and various processes of guitar making that I couldn't really learn at, at college uh, in the amount of time that I had there. So uh, it was invaluable really to have that time and I, I paid a little bit of money on the rent of the workshop and my mother helped me to, to support myself and I was with him there for a, a two or three years and I was building mainly Dreadnought and OM guitars at that point which were as a consequence of, of loving Joni Mitchell and Stephen Stills and um, the, the Dreadnought was a really big part of what I was interested in so you know after you've made 20 of those in, in I suppose in, in 18 months gradually you start building up a, an idea of how these things should sound and uh, I just kept kept repeating that process. As you build up this amount of hours uh, you start to also realize that you're, you're, the goal that you're trying to achieve is getting harder and harder to, to get to because you start noticing a lot more in the guitar making and, and those little sort of advances take so much time and you start unlocking this world that that you had no idea was there really you'd look at a guitar as a novice and one guitar looks very much like another but what I started to realize was that the really great guitars had something very special and unique about them and I think essentially that's what you begin to realize that you, you're heading in that direction and I became obsessed with advancing in that way and around that time I saw my first Collings guitar and Santa Cruz guitar and those became a real big benchmark of what I was trying to achieve and along with meeting some uh, two makers in Germany uh, Henkes and Blatzer they were two guys working in a small workshop like mine and yet they were achieving a build quality and sound quality that was unlike anything I'd ever seen so I, I became very aware that it was achievable what I was after. Along the way making guitars you start to get a few opportunities that if you do it long enough players gradually come your way and a friend of mine had had bought a guitar off me early on and he was doing quite well in the music business and he'd started writing with a guy called Boo Hewardine who'd, who'd written Patience of Angels for Eddie Reader who I was a massive fan of and and was cited it actually before I even knew who he was as sort of the, the sort of music that I would like to get my guitars to and a strange quirk of fate, he, he called me up and, and said, look, I'd like to order one, and, and he ordered an OM, which I, I built and then took up to London to, to show him, and, and he, he took it away, 
and then phoned me later on that day and said he loved it and that was a real beginning success story for me. It, it made me really believe in what we were doing which was essential. Uh, and then the players started coming through Boo really. Eddie Reader ordered a guitar, Jim Murray and lots of other folk players, Chris Drever who's very big on the, the folk scene, plays in the band Lau. And then we started getting more into the pop world as well. Uh, Richard Hawley started to uh, take an interest after a friend of mine called Kate Walsh had toured with him and he bought several guitars from us and was instrumental in, in um, helping us to take the guitars to a wider scene. Uh, he was touring with Elbow at the time and Elbow bought a guitar and then the McColl brothers um, they were, uh, this is um, uh, Ewan McColl's sons and uh, Peggy Seeger's sons. They were both touring with influential artists. Um, Neil was with David Gray, and um, Callum plays with everybody, but at the time he was with uh, Boyzone, actually, and I ended up making a guitar for Ronan Keating as well, which completely unexpected for me. And we went up to the O2, and he, he uh, um, took the guitar, and. Uh, yeah, it's, it takes you in all sorts of places, this, this, um, this guitar making. But essentially, you always come back to the workshop, and that's where the work is done. I began to need more space, really, and uh, we moved out of our workshop um, on the farm, and I bought this workshop here in, in uh, Hurston, which is a two-storey, um, workshop. It means that we can have the machines downstairs and the quiet sort of more hand work upstairs and uh, we can control the environment that we're in much better here which is so important for guitar making because uh, essentially our guitars go all over the world and they need to stand up to those environments. Um, it also meant that I could invest in a CNC machine and we learned how to use that to make components and parts for our guitars and it's an integral part of what we do now because the CNC machine in, in enables us to to make the same thing over and over again but the, the programming of the CNC machine it, the machine is only as good as the programmer so you know you can make a, an awful neck on a CNC machine uh, and on the same CNC machine you can make an incredible neck and um, it took us a long time to get to grips with that and we only ever start using the parts on the, from the CNC machine when they surpass what we're doing by hand really and uh, so that that enabled us to get to a wider audience really because we could sort of build a few more guitars I mean we're never going to make a huge amount of, of guitars but we we can make between 60 and 80 guitars now between the two of us. Um, so that became a very important part of what we do. Last year I, I saw that we were really making some of the best guitars that we'd ever made and a lot of the, the developments that we'd been concentrating on had started to pay off. And it's become quite exciting now because I feel that we're able to take our guitars to a new level and that new level has enabled us to you know get in amongst some great players so I've, I've started to invest in the future of what we're doing here a lot more and I've been buying some superb woods and we've been working on lots of new uh, techniques and moulds and jigs I believe now we're really ready to take on the world and, and for our guitars to go much further afield, which is a really exciting prospect for us now. So maybe, you know, if you're, if you're in the area, come and see us, or if you're near a shop that sells our guitars, go and try some out. I think you'll be excited. <laughs>